2017 CDL General Knowledge Exam Questions and Answers Part 1 This is a Barry Branton video production. Hi, this is Barry Branton. Welcome to my video. I want you to know that you are the reason why I made this video. My goal in all of this is to help you so without any further ado, let's get started studying for your commercial driver's license general knowledge exam. In this video, you and I will be covering part one, which consists of 25 questions. In part two, we will be covering the remaining 25 questions. Question number one, you should cover your cargo because many states require it to protect your cargo from bad weather to protect individuals from any spilled cargo all of these are correct question number two what can you do at an accident site to help avoid another accident? Correct answer is put out warning devices so people don't run into the accident site. We have a explanation here. Unless you are injured as a commercial driver it's your duty to ensure that drivers see your vehicle at the accident scene. You should put out warning devices as quickly as possible as a means towards preventing further accidents. For example, a pileup. Question number three. What is not one of the four skill areas that operating a commercial motor vehicle requires. So in this particular case you're looking for a skill that is not required for operating a CMV, commercial motor vehicle. What is not required is a first aid certification. Okay, uh, But the required ones are steering, accelerating, and safely backing. So let's go over the explanation. While first aid certification could certainly come in handy at some point during your career, it is not one of the four skill areas mentioned that you must be proficient in for safe vehicle operation. Question number four. How many tie downs are required for a 20 foot load? correct answer is two tie downs and we have a bit of an explanation here so let's go over that the rule is that you should have one tie down per 10 feet of cargo and you must have at least two per load regardless of the length so 20 feet you would have two Question number five. The most important hand signal you should agree on with your helper is the correct answer is stop. And we have an explanation. Unfortunately, let me just scroll this up some. Unfortunately, one, oh, pardon me, unfortunately, once an accident happens, you can't take it back. That's why it's absolutely essential that you and your helper have a very clear hand signal for stop so that you'll be able to stop what you are doing quickly before an accident occurs. Question number six. How can you start moving without rolling backwards? Now we have a question here all the answers are correct so let's go over each and every one of them 
Engage the clutch before removing your foot from the brake. Put on the parking brake whenever necessary. Apply the hand valve. Now we have an explanation, so let's go over that. If you have a manual transmission vehicle, partly engage the clutch before you take your right foot off the brake. Put on the parking brake whenever necessary to keep from rolling back. Release the parking bra brake only. Let me just repeat that. Release the parking brake only when you have applied enough power, engine power, to keep the to keep from rolling back. On a tractor trailer equipped with a trailer brake hand valve. The hand valve can be applied to keep from rolling back. Let's go on to the next question. Question number seven. To maintain alertness during the trip, drivers should. Now in this particular situation, all the answers are correct. We'll go over each one. The first one is get eight to nine hours of sleep. Schedule trips during the daytime hours and avoid medications that cause drowsiness. Now we have an explanation. Let's go over that. Sleep debt is a dangerous condition in which missing sleep adds up and you risk falling asleep at the wheel until you are fully rested. People often people are often surprised when they find out that getting less than six hours of sleep per night triples your risk of accident. To prevent drowsiness before a trip, the drowser, the driver that is, the driver should get adequate sleep. Adults need eight to nine hours of sleep to maintain alertness. Prepare route carefully to identify total distance, stopping points, and other logistic cons logistical considerations. Schedule trips for the hours you are normally awake not in the middle of the night. Drive with a passenger. Avoid medications that cause drowsiness. Consult your physician if you suffer from daytime sleepiness. Have difficulty sleeping at night or take frequent naps. Incorporate exercise into your daily life to give you more energy. Okay, next question. Question number eight. Which of the following is a key steering component? Okay, um, none of the distractors are, so the correct answer is the gearbox. And we have an explanation. The gearbox is an integral part of the steering system. All the other options are key pieces of the suspension system. Number 10. What is or makes up a hazardous materials placard? The correct answer is signs on the outside of the vehicle that identify the hazard class of cargo. We have an explanation here. Hazardous material placards are four regulated signs on the outside of the vehicle that identify the hazard class of cargo for those who need to know such as emergency service personnel or those who load or unload cargo. Next question. Number 11. What will help a person intoxicated with alcohol to sober up? The only correct answer is time. Um, and the explanation is there are no fast answers for getting the alcohol out of your system. Since it is inside your bloodstream, coffee and fresh air will not do the trick. You must wait until you are sober. 
or you risk losing your CDL if you drive while under the influence. Next question. The minimum tire tread depth for the front tires is 4 30 seconds of an inch. And we have an explanation. The minimum is 4 30 seconds inch depth for tire tread on the front tires, while all the other tires require at least 2 30 seconds inch of tread depth. So remember this, front 4 30 seconds, everything else 2 30 seconds. Okay, next question. There we go. Number question number 12. Which of the following should you do when confronted by an aggressive driver? Now, this is one of the situations where all the answers are correct, so let's go over each one of the options. Number 1. If you can safely do it, call the police from a cell phone. Also, avoid eye contact and ignore ignore rude gestures and refuse to react negatively. So all the answers are correct. And we have an explanation here. When an, when an aggressive driver is trying to confront you, don't supply them the conflict they desire. Instead, contact the police and request help. Next question. Question number 13. Where should you place your warning devices if you must stop on a one-way or divided highway? The correct answer is 10 feet, 100 feet, and 200 feet towards approaching traffic. Um, and it helps me, you know, if you're like uh, pulling off on a one-way uh, or divided highway, uh, basically, um, usually the on the approaching traffic is coming from the rear. So all of your uh, warning devices will be in the rear of your vehicle, 10 feet, 100 feet, and at 200 feet. Now we have an explanation here, so let's go over that. On a one-way or divided highway, you want to stretch your warning devices out, but still have them close enough to the vehicle that makes it clear that you are stopped. Devices at 10, 100, and 200 feet accomplish this goal. Next question. Question number 14. Which of these is not part of the basic method for shifting up? So we're looking for the answer that is not part. So um, we know from this multiple choice type of question, we have three that are part. So the three that are part are releasing the clutch, pushing in the clutch, and shifting into higher gear at the same time and releasing the clutch and pressing the accelerator at the same time. But we are looking for the not part. So the not part, which is not, which of these is not part of the basic method of shifting up? That would be accelerating while pressing the clutch and turning toward the driver's side. Now uh, we have an explanation here, so let's go over that. You must release the accelerator, push in the clutch, shift to neutral, release the clutch, let the engine and gears slow down for the next gear, then push in the clutch and shift into a higher gear at the same time, then release the clutch and press the accelerator. Acceleration is not involved until the very end and definitely not while pressing the clutch. So let's take a look at these. Okay, so let's go on to the next question. 
question number 16, uh, pardon me, 15. During your pre-trip inspection exam, when examining hoses with the instructor, you advise him that you are looking uh, at the ground for, actually I just read that question wrong, you advise him that you are looking for puddles on the ground, okay, which would be indicative of um, leaking hoses, possibly. Um, so of course all the distractors are incorrect. So let's go and look at the explanation. During your pre-trip test, when inspecting hoses, you need to look for signs of leaks and cracks of the hoses, such as puddles on the ground. This, a puddle on the ground would, would be indicative of uh, a leak, which would result from a, a crack of a hose. It says here, fluids are that are dripping on the underside of the engine or transmission. This is also check holds, hoses for leaks or problems. Okay. All right, next question, number 16. What is the gross vehicle weight, GVW? Okay. It's the total weight of a single vehicle and its load. Okay. Now we have an explanation here. GVW is the simplest of the vehicle weight explanations, standing for just a single vehicle and the load it is carrying. Next question. Number 17. You should place the starter switch key in your pocket while you are performing the pre-trip inspection because someone could start and move the truck and if you are say behind the vehicle or in front of it that could be a bad thing now we have an explanation here we're gonna go over that when you are performing a pre-trip inspection you do not want someone such as a co-driver to start your vehicle while unaware of your location and accidentally injure you. Also, if you're looking at the engine and you're checking the belts or something and they start the engine, it could take your hand off. So definitely you want the keys to the vehicle in your pocket. Next question. Which two special conditions indicate that you are, that, pardon me, which two indications, pardon me, I just keep making mistakes here, let me correct myself. Which two special, which two special conditions indicate that you should downshift? Correct answer is starting down a hill and entering a curve. Let's take a look at the explanation. Downshifting before starting down a hill allows you to take advantage of engine braking. You should downshift to the gear required, which is usually lower than the gear required to climb the hill. Downshifting before a curve improves stability and ensures you will have the power available to accelerate out of the turn. Next question. Which of the following determines the safe speed for going down a steep downgrade? Now this will be all of these are correct. So what are the different components that are of this correct answer? Which of the following determines the safe speed for going down a steep downgrade, the road conditions, the total weight of the vehicle and cargo, the steepness of the grade. There are several factors that help you decide upon a safe speed for going down a steep downgrade, including its steepness, length, the road and weather conditions, 
and your ve and your vehicle and cargo weight. Number 20. Is it true that as long as the engine is not overheated, it is completely safe to remove the radiator cap? No, it's not completely safe. The answer is no. We have an explanation. It is not enough for the engine not to be overheated. The system should have cooled down completely, and I emphasize the word completely, before you even attempt to remove the radiator cap. And even then, you should be very careful, as there may be tremendous pressure and damaging steam and fluids. Next question. Question number 21. While driving at night, which lights should you use as often as you can? Now, the operative word here is can. You can't always use the high beams, but the correct answer is high beams. Um, and here's the explanation. Let's just go over that. When driving at night, you should be using your high beams to expand your field of vision as often as possible. As long as it is safe and legal and you will not blind any other drivers. The rule of thumb is to put them on as long as there are no approaching vehicles within 500 feet. Next question. Question number 22. It has just reached freezing. Which of the following areas is slippery? Now, this is one of the situations or one of the questions where we have all of them are correct. So, the components are, which of the following areas are slippery? A bridge, when it's just reached freezing. A shaded area when it's just reached freezing, a wet looking road when it's just reached freezing. All of those will be slippery. Let's go over the explanation. Once the temperature dips down to freezing, some areas of the road will start to freeze. The, f the first to go will be areas without sun, shaded areas and bridges. If the road appears wet, that could also herald the arrival of black ice, a thin layer of slippery ice through which you can s actually see the road. Okay, next question. What happens when you let air out of hot tires? Okay, the correct answer is, this is a bad idea because when the tires cool off, the pressure will be too low. Okay, let's go over the explanation. When tires get hot, when tires get hot, the air pressure rises. However, relieving that pressure will leave the air pressure too low later and the tires may catch fire or blow out. It will also not have a cooling effect. If your tires are too hot to touch, stop until they have cooled down. Okay, next question. Question number 24. To help you stay alert and safe while driving, you should, and the correct answer is, Avoid medications with warning labels. We have an explanation, which is be careful with me medications. Be careful with medications that warn you they may cause drowsiness. If you have a concern about prescribed medications, 
speak to your doctor. Do not even try to make up for sleepiness with coffee, fresh air, or especially alcohol. The only cure for being tired is sleeping until you are rested. Okay, now we have question 25. Okay, which of the following should you not, asking you what you should not do if you experience a tire failure? So, you're searching for an option that is not, that is, or you're searching for an option that is inadvisable. In other words, what you're not supposed to do. With respect to this question, okay, so it's inadvisable to engage the brakes hard and immediately. This is what you're not supposed to do, okay? What are you supposed to do if you experience a tire failure? Well, you need to be aware that the tire has failed, okay? You need to hold the steering wheel firmly and you need to stay off the brake pedal. And here's our um, explanation. While it's natural to want to take control of the situation by braking, slamming on your brakes could actually put the vehicle out of control. So slowly brake once you are in control of the vehicle. Okay, that's been 25 questions. We're going to call this video part one and we will uh, finish the other 25 remaining questions in part two. Uh, this is Barry Branton. If you like this vehicle, um, pardon me, if you like this video, not vehicle, but video, please go ahead and like it. And uh, if you have any comments, please go ahead and leave me a comment and I'll be happy to answer you, answer you if I can. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye-bye now.